This episode is brought to you by Cox Home Life. Cox helps make your home smarter. And now you can pull up your home life cameras on your TV with your contour voice remote and some simple voice commands. To learn more, visit cox.com slash this is home. This podcast is coming to you on MPN, the marketing podcast network. There's another show on MPN you might like as well. I'm Nick Westergaard, host of the On Brand Podcast. Each week, I interview marketing thought leaders or those working for innovative brands like Adobe, Ben & Jerry's, HBO, Salesforce, and Whole Foods. You'll learn how to tell stronger stories and build better brands. Just visit onbrandpodcast.com or search for On Brand with Nick Westergaard wherever you like to listen. This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Want Instagrammers and YouTubers to mention your brand, or do you want to influence an audience to buy your product? I'm Jason Falls, author of the book Winfluence, reframing influencer marketing to ignite your brand. In this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate the difference between using influencers and actually influencing. Welcome to Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. I've been a student of stand-up comedy from my earliest memories. I would stay up late when I was little to watch The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson just to see the monologue, then hope beyond all hope one of the acts that night was a comedian. Later, I fell in love with David Letterman, who had more comedians and introduced me to a broader love of the craft. I bought cassette tapes of Dennis Miller, Bobcat Goldthwait, and more, And of course, anyone who grew up in the 1980s and loved stand-up comedy had Eddie Murphy's Delirious and Raw memorized. I love stand-up and stand-up comedians, so I was quite aware of the plight of them during the pandemic. Clubs couldn't open safely, many closed for good, and the comedians themselves, well, they had to turn to alternative ways to earn a living. One of those comedians used the challenge of the pandemic to turn his colleagues from the club circuit into content creators for brands. Richie Redding spent 19 years as a club comedian. The last 13 of those, it was his full-time job. When he reached the point of pandemic panic, not knowing how he was going to pay the bills, he got a call from an ad agency that needed a funny video. The ask to be a content creator lit a fire under him, and Redding started a comedy consulting firm. Funnier Than You Are offers brands the opportunity to tap into professional comedians for comedy content. Reading forms a writer's room and matches the writer friends of his with the brand's target audience. The content they're producing is making a dent, helping brands churn out far better content than they would otherwise, even from their agencies. And I'm an agency guy! But beyond that, Redding is expanding the concept to help build individual influence and influencer status for his roster of comedy writers, too. Richie and I caught up recently to talk about how comedy and marketing intersect, the difference between humorous content from an agency and comedy from a professional comedian, and why brands should think about comedians as content creators and influencers. And I geek out with him a bit about stand up comedy, too, which I think turned out not as eye-rolling as you might think. Before we get to that, we learned last episode that Tagger, our presenting sponsor, has a new feature out called Signals. It's a form of social listening, but specific to influencers and influencer topics. As you probably know by now, Tagger is our presenting sponsor in a complete influencer marketing software suite. It allows you to find, connect, and collaborate with influencers, execute campaigns, and measure success. This new feature makes the platform even stronger. Instead of me telling you about it, though, I asked Pete Kennedy, the founder and president at Tagger, to tell us more about it. So let's talk about the brands out there who are uh, using Tagger. And they're probably using Tagger for, you know, let's let's find influencers that fall into a certain vertical, etc. What what's the first two or three things that you would recommend that they use signals for to layer on top of what they're already doing? So the first thing I would do is do a competitive analysis report to understand who are your top 10 competitors? uh, What campaigns they place to market? Who are they hiring? How many impressions are they placing in market? And when you look at throughout a year, 
Uh, what are the months that they're putting the most impressions into market? So it really gives you that propensity to spend analysis for all the brands within your industry. Um, you also might be doing something around uh, a time frame like Valentine's Day or, or Father's Day. Well, what is uh, what are topics that influencers are talking about right now around those times that you could uh, create a strategy around for your influencer marketing campaigns? Um, and then we also look at some really interesting things, like we were looking at ethical beauty, for example, because one of our clients is in that space, and just understanding, you know, over the last five years, where have conversations of ethical beauty migrated around the world? Very strong in the U.S. early on, and then it's migrated into the U.K. It migrated over to, over to Australia. So really understanding global trends with these keywords helps you place strategies not only in the United States and, you know, everywhere around the world. Outstanding. Thanks to Pete and to Tagger for the great product and for helping bring this podcast to you each week. To learn more and get a demo to see if Tagger is right for you, even if it's just to check out the new signals feature, just visit jason.online slash Tagger today. That's jason.online slash Tagger. The comedian turning comics into brand content creators and even influencers. Richie Redding from Funnier Than You Are is next on Winfluence. I promise the listeners I'm going to get to the killer influence marketing parts today, but I can't have a stand-up comedian on the show and not geek out a little bit. Richie, tell me about how you got into comedy and give us a little framework around what it's like to do that for a living. I would like to start off by saying uh, if there's anybody who has that dream, uh, don't do it. <laughs> get out while you can. <laughs> it's a, it's an illness, damn it. Uh, yeah, man, it's it's something that I – I knew my entire life that I wanted to do. Um, like there was my, my first high was absolutely making my family laugh. You know, like I remember being three years old and the whole family laughing at something I was doing. It was like, this is it. And then, uh, when I, when I was in grade school through, through high school, it was like, whenever I was sick and you could like, remember when you could rent like two or three movies, mm -hmm. your call, yep. how sweet that was. It was always, dude, it was like, Carlin Pryor, you know, like it was, yeah. it was the greats. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I just memorized every bit of stand up <laughs> I could, I could find. And then, um, after college, I, I had some job that I hated and, uh, I, I basically just started writing at my desk and I was writing stuff and sending it out to my friends and they were constantly like, dude, you gotta, you just gotta get on stage, man. And, uh, and that job, for whatever reason, uh, came to a head. I got fired because I was <laughs> writing comedy bits instead of uh, actually doing my work. And the two days after I got fired, I went on stage for the first time. And uh, I mean, I've I've never. So a, a funny thing is that the, nobody will ever put more importance and and like more hurdles in front of themselves than the first time that you get on stage. Mm -hmm. And it's 100% the least important. Yeah. Right. It's important because you're doing it, but it's like, you're not going to, there, there's zero consequences whatsoever. <laughs> um, and I started out at a notorious, no, notorious place called the laugh house. Um, oh, nice. Gone, but not forgotten, which is also, uh, the, it's the home of Kevin Hart. And, uh, it was, it, it, so there was two clubs in town in Philly at that time. One was out in the burbs. The other one was, was downtown and I didn't have a car. So I wound up starting at the black club and absolutely was an unreplaceable experience because, uh, it, it, I learned to perform there, yeah. you know, and it was like, and it, it actually, it, it, it's carried over extremely well into advertising and marketing stuff because I used to have what I called the 10 second rule. Which is that, like, in, with that audience, I had me looking like me had ten seconds or less to make them like me. Yeah, you know? and, and if I didn't, it was going to be uphill. So the, the the translation is that like everything that I write, it's like within three seconds, you better like this, or they're going to move. You know, they're they're going to move on. So um, yeah, I'm not sure if I answered the question, but no, that's uh, that's a that's a great philosophy on on you know writing for anything, not just uh, comedy, but 
Um, you know, great writing. If you can't capture their attention that quickly, then you've you've got a challenge ahead of you. I wonder is is it true? And, and for, I hope the audience will forgive me, but I just geek out about stand up comedy. I wonder is it true? Because uh, I've heard this from a couple of people that when comedians get together and kind of share material, they don't actually laugh, but instead say that's funny, like they're a professor grading a paper. Uh, yeah. I mean, because if if it's if it's material. Like if it's like, hey, let me run this past you, then it's yeah, it's uh, there's kind of a scientific approach to it. But like, I mean, we laugh our asses off at non-material all the time, and <laughs> and that's how stuff, that's how a lot of stuff gets turned into material. Is like, you know, if if you just say something in the moment that that totally lands, it's like ah, this is going in. But uh, that's also the way to spot a uh, a scrub comic that tries to wedge material into a conversation, you will get booed out of the green room. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> Beat it. You stink. You stink. Like it. It's good to you. know. It's good yeah. to know. I've had this like this like, you know, inner voice telling me to, you know, go do an open mic night at some point. And maybe mm-hmm. I will, but I've always just thought, nah, I just don't I'm not I don't I don't have it in me. But who knows? You never know. I mean, um, there's zero consequences, bro. That's true. I may do it one day just for the hell of it. So I know that just, just for my own edification, I know the club circuit is basically set up where you, you typically have a headliner and you have a featured act, which is kind of the middle spot in the lineup and you have an opener. And sometimes you also have an MC there. Who's also a comedian. If they're not someone who owns the club, just out of curiosity, what's the pay like from one spot to another? Cause I know unless you're a headliner, it's a bear to earn a living just doing that. Right. It's too depressing to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's um, it's in it's a, uh, a a real problem within the industry that like host and feature pay hasn't gone up in thirty years. Wow! And I think that I always say is that it's like it, it, in the same way that uh, certain political parties think that poor people are magic, uh, that clubs think that features are magic. It's like, yeah, man, we'd love to have you come to uh, Indianapolis. Uh, yeah, just get yourself here and uh, put yourself up. It's mm-hmm. Like, and it, wait, and how much is it? It's like a hundred dollars a show. Like, yeah, I'm going to not do that. So, yeah. what 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 it causes is that it, it like it kind of injures the craft because getting over that hump from feature to to headliner comes at such a, a crazy expense. And, and now it's, um, it's much more followers driven and has, has, it has increasingly less to do with how funny you are and how well you do as how many followers you have and how many asses go in the seats, which, you know, I mean, I, I get it's a business, but it's like, there are just some real doo-doo comics out there that are selling out one time and people will never come see them again. You know? Right. Right. So on the other end of that hard work, though, in if you get past that, a small percentage of the total, I'm sure, you know, gets through to the, you know, Comedy Central special and then maybe a Netflix or Hulu or some larger network special. Then you can get it into theater shows and really make some money. But that's like winning the lottery, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, look, it's a it's an asymmetrical pay scale, right? It's uh, it's as close to the uh the distribution of wealth as uh as drug dealers <laughs> that it's like you've got your kingpin you've got some capos but most of them are just uh, guys on the corner selling crack out of their underpants so <laughs> but man I'm, well, I'm somewhere in between uh underpants and capo <laughs> <laughs> at least you got out of the underpants business that's I good. don't mean to brag <laughs> yeah well and that's that's kind of been uh what's been so amazing about starting this company, which I mean, we haven't contextualized yet, but is that it's, it's given me the freedom to turn down things that I yeah. don't want to do. And I don't have to chase every show anymore. Um, and, and also the thing that I'm really proud of is that, uh, in, I just did the math on it of, of how much I've paid comics since starting this. Mm-hmm. And it's significantly more than I've, ever made in a single year of comedy. 
That's great. Uh, which is a, you know, it's a special thing to me to be able to give back like that because I, I pay them what they're worth. Well, now that points us into the direction of, of why I wanted to have you on the show because, uh, I, and I'll back off my geek out tangent. <laughs> Com- comedians often have to make money from other sources to eke out a living while I'm sure, you know, some have non-comedy jobs during the day or week. Comedy writing is in high demand these days from brands and lends itself to someone being able to create a path online and becoming an influencer as well. So building an audience around your content, your point of view, and so on. And your business is now built around connecting brands and agencies with people who are funnier than them. Tell us about it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've been a comic for 19 years and the, and I've been full time for 13 that, Miraculously, I did not have a uh, a job outside of comedy for that time. Uh, I probably should have for sure at points, <laughs> but uh, you know the the pandemic wiped everything out. And the inciting incident for my company was that uh, right in the point where I was doing some soul searching of like, am I ever going to get back on stage again? You know, like is it over? I I got this uh, super random call from an Israeli ad agency that was looking for a funny commercial. And I undercharged, over-delivered. I was not prepared to haggle with Israelis. (laughs) And I also (laughs) just was so excited to have anything to do that uh, I – they wanted one commercial in two weeks and I gave them four the next day because I'm obsessive when I'm writing wow. about something and they were pumped about all of them. And my girlfriend was like, yeah, you can start a comedy consulting company. Babe. And I was like, yeah, we're funnier than you are. And just clicked. And I knew that was going to be the name of it. And, um, I honestly, I expected to find a hundred comedy consultants when I went online and there's one dude <laughs> that calls himself that who's clearly an open micer that writes jokes for other open micers. So maybe you should hit this guy if it's really <laughs> on your bucket list, but he will write you a page of stand up comedy jokes, Jason, for $150. Oh, wow. And I can't tell you how badly I want to spend that money and go eat shit on stage i mean just (laughs) because i'm gonna like tell him i'm a goat herder you know like just make it specific about me and it's like so i was herding these goats the other day but at any rate uh yeah so you know i was i was just absolutely on fire for this idea when when it first hit me um because it, it was always about the writer's room that was the first thing that came to me because but you know i've i've had I've had jobs like, you know, in writer's rooms and, uh, and the, the way that a lot of TV shows get built is that they'll have, so like I was part of a writer's room that got the, got 50 cent his, his show. And Mm -hmm. it's like, all right, we've got 50 cent and nothing else. What would you do if you were him? And we spent a couple days and build a deck. It was, it was me and three other comics. We build a deck. And at the end of those two days, we have not just the show's concept, but we have the first three episodes mapped out. Wow. And they take that and they go and sell the show. So I approached my buddy from a buddy of mine that's uh, from college is a he's a CMO of a, a major, 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 major uh, healthcare company. And I asked him what he thought of that concept of of having comedians come up with marketing ideas. And he was like, dude. I would pay just to have my team see a room full of people that's not afraid to fail. Yeah. And I was like, really? And he's yeah. like, he's like, dude, corporate ideation is so boring. Yep. It's like you got he's like, you got he's like, cause everybody just they're just afraid of of failing. And he's like, you guys like don't care if something doesn't go over well. He's like, I'm like, bombing? He's like, Yeah, you don't care about bombing, right? He's like, I'm like, dude. It's hilarious. Like if somebody bombs in the writer's room, we literally throw things at them. <laughs> and, you know, and it's, and it's just, you just got to cover up and you go out in a blaze of FUs yeah. that, you know, and, and you <laughs> keep swinging and you'll, you'll get another one. And he's like, that's worth money. Yeah. Right, right there. That is. So, um, it went from that to, and I really, I, it, the, the biggest challenge in this whole thing has been that. I don't know anything about agencies or the actual business structure of marketing, right? So all I, I, I basically just started, and it was during the pandemic, I, I just, I, I called every person that I know that's, you know, that's in the business world and bounced the idea off of them and fleshed it out. And 
then basically just took to LinkedIn and started introducing myself to people and, um, which is how we met. Right. Yep. And I've probably introduced myself to over a thousand people since this started. And, um, and it's been amazing how gracious people are with their time. And it's basically always either a, a, a hell no or a hell yes. But mm-hmm. it's like the, the first couple things that we got, it was always like, that's crazy enough to work, Yep. you know? And the, uh, so I know I told you this, but the, the first, the, the very first thing that we got, it was a, 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 uh, an ammunition company was getting trolled by a conspiracy theory that they were hoarding their own ammunition. And it wasn't the <laughs> 10 million guns that got sold during the race riots that was uh, causing an, <laughs> an ammo right. shortage. And, uh, but they wanted to clap back at it. So I, I built a, a writer's room that was me and three redneck comics. Nice. And and I got some redneck in me. Um, and their best view count ever was 80,000 views. And ours has like three and a half million. Nice. Um, and, and that was a piece of it that I, that I didn't realize was so novel. And it was just, it was always obvious to me is that the, the real value proposition now that this is the opposite of a, uh, elevator pitch and I'm, I'm now <laughs> 10 minutes into my spiel and I, I, I tell your, your advertising audience what my value prop is, what a dick, uh, it's that we help brands to connect with their audience through humor and the way that I do it. It, that's especially unique is I build a writer's room of professional comedians that belong to the target demographic. And that piece of it, um, it is just extremely valuable. So the, the second project that we did was we, we, we made the natural progression from ammunition to Easter eggs and pause Easter egg guy wanted to speak to moms in the pandemic. So I just built a writer's room full of moms. And, and like, it's just been one case of that after another, um, we did a thing, I just had a a thing where, um, a company had 30 minutes with John McEnroe as an influencer. Um, and as an aside, the smartest thing that I did as part of the company is that my talent coordinator is, uh, Amy Hawthorne, who is one of the biggest comedy show bookers in the country. She books over 2000 shows a year. So if there's anybody that I don't know after 19 years, she does. And uh, the, so the perfect example was with this Mac and Roe gig. They, ha- they had him for 30 minutes and they needed to pitch him like four different fully fleshed out concepts and he would pick which one he wanted to use. So uh, within like 15 minutes, we got a, the comic that's the head ro- roast writer for ESPN and then a professional tennis player turned comedian and a current tennis pro that's a comic. Um, and just smoked it you know yeah. it's like I, I know a lot of ad agencies smartly have comics that they refer to and and that's great and i love that they do that and you know support comedy all it, however you can but the thing that we bring that really nobody from an outside agency can do is that zeroed in dialed in we know exactly who the nerds are that you know from the comedy community that uh that 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 can speak to your audience so yeah. what, a, what a smart way to to plug the you know talented funny people you know from that world into a something that gives them work but b something that helps brands get better at marketing communications and and providing them with that comedy writer's room so this is a really neat example of my concept of influence marketing versus influencer marketing and Bear with me on this, those of you out there listening, because it might seem a bit of a stretch, but I can go out and hire a TikTok person with a lot of followers who is funny and collaborate on content. That's the influencer marketing way of thinking. But I could also tap into talented, funny people to write my content for me and or produce my videos for me and carve out uh, at least relevance, if not influence for my brand. So I'm investing in people with influence through their talents and skills as comedy writers. Would you agree with that perspective on it? Yeah, I've, I've never heard it put that way. But um, yeah, the my my real vision for the company, which is on the very cusp of actually being realized that I've literally 
five minutes before we got on, I was just uh, just pitching a company that they already did the writer's room, and now we need to, I want to create the video. So, mm-hmm. um, the what I really where I really see a shining is having comics as the writers as the talent and also influencers yes so we work with the brand and like it it all starts with the writer's room i call it the idea machine but we we write on brief and on brand of, of of what they're looking for based on their customer insights they tell us exactly who their customer is so i take that with the you know, before I present it to the comics, I synthesize it into the most basic form of how we're talking to this audience. Um, and then based on that report, we can then book the talent. So we all, we offer end to end video production. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, it, which was an unintended consequence because clients were just coming back to us like, Hey, can you actually make this video? Like, Oh yeah, yeah that's easy. <laughs> uh, so it's easy. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And th- so what I really, really want to do is have comics in the, in the content that have a following, but that, that it also directly applies to. So like, you know, we're, we're, we're talking to this organic alcohol company that their, their audience is millennial women and the talent that I want to have in the, in the videos it, are two comics that are podcasters that are basically professionals at giving advice to millennial women so that the brand gets, like you were saying, they get, they get their own influence because they get their message. Cause a problem that you see a lot of times with a, with influencer marketing, I think, and my girlfriend is an influencer as a matter of fact, is that it's like, they, they give them copy that it's like, well, I would never say this where I would never put it this way. Or it's just like, you know, just talk about your experience with it. But there's no, ah, there's not that thing Mm -hmm. that, that it's, that that's going to stick, right? There's nothing that has that stickiness because it's just like, you're just relying on somebody just delivering this really bland copy. But yeah, to your point, if you can, if you can marry influence and, and influencers, Mm -hmm. that makes a ton of sense because what it, you know, what I want to do is so like with, with the case of the, uh, of the alcohol company, that organic alcohol company is that if, if they put those two in the video, they can then pay them as influencers, go in and boost the hell out of it, targeting the bachelor. Right. Right. Like targeting these huge cross sections of people of millennial women that follow them, that follow them in the cities where their beverage is available Mm -hmm. and just really dial it in. And like the way that I was always trying to explain it to them is like, look, there's you couldn't pay somebody to visit your page if it's just a bunch of ads. Right. Right. That and like, but you can pull another audience over to you by by getting in the way of that. Right. Mm-hmm. Like you can put yourself in views way basically by by bringing in these people that already have this audience. Um, and and it's it's been a thing that we've that we've uh, experienced is that um, if something's entertaining and informative, it it has just a crazy impact on the on the organic views and like the thing that we use as a case study all the time i think i showed it to you is uh it's this company's usual asset burnout rate was like three or four weeks Mm -hmm. and it's now at like the 45 week mark and it's still outperforming their their best asset on a daily basis yeah and it's because people share it and nobody shares an ad but they'll share a sketch that happens to have an ad in it. Yeah, that's good stuff. So you're going to screw around here at some point and wind up with an influencer talent agency on the back end of this thing, you know, having people come to you and say, I want that comedian X to do ABC XYZ. So that's uh, that's smart. It's a good business plan, I think. So Yeah, if I'm not careful, I might yeah. 
be successful. <laughs> <laughs> so the the promise that uh, I think brands see from an offering like yours is, oh, we're we're finally going to go viral, or they're going to have you know an ad that people actually want watch and respond to. But n- neither of those are bankable guarantees. What do you tell a client that says that's what I want? I want to go viral. Um, pump your brakes. And yeah, I mean, that's like, well, there's, there's a definition of viral, which is three times your normal view count, right? That's doable. Um, yeah. And and it's like just naturally going viral was also two internets ago and fair. Like, yeah, it's like, it, it all starts with a willingness to promote and boost, and it's not a matter of one video. Like it has to be a campaign. Um, you know, I, I have ideas as to what gives them the most chances of going viral and and strategies for that. But yeah, I would never I, like. I guarantee. Ooh, no, 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 no money yeah. back. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 one of those things that it's like the it's managing expectations i guess right yeah. of, of like i think you kind of have to base it on what's your your previous best video and and what do you expect to get out of it when you look out there at uh influencers and i'll i'll use air quotes on the influencers um on tiktok or instagram or youtube that are creating humor whether or not they're actually funny is subjective but the ones that aren't stand up comedians but are trying to be funny do you typically think amateurs or is your reaction that there's a dozen ways to slice the pie? And if you can get it, go get it, get it, go get it. Um, yeah, I think, uh, it's just a, it's a, a very different muscle than what we do on stage, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's people that are very, very funny on, on TikTok, Um, and there's, there's an equal amount of, uh, of absolute misses. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what, uh, that that's the thing, the difference, especially in creating content when it's going to, when there's a, a production budget going into it and it's like, this is going to, we're, we're spending money and there's other people involved. It's like, you can't miss with a, when you're going for funny with a, uh, with a, with a produced video. But I, I think the TikTok kids, they've, they've got their thing and it's like, they, there's not one kind of funny, right? Like, yeah, the, the brands that that lean into it really benefit from it. Uh, a great example is, now that I've meandered all over the place, there, a great example of it is um, like Blue Chew. The, the, like the, the boner pills and, uh, and underpants companies have, have really gone all in on podcasters, right? And a big reason for that is that it's that same thing we were talking about. It's like, you can't make these people visit your site, but if you've already, if somebody has their attention and they trust that person, let that person deliver the message in their own way. That makes a ton of sense. Great way to think but, about it. Yeah. So my buddies, uh, Andrew Schultz and Akash Singh, they have this podcast called uh, flagrant two and they, they all took blue chew when they got it. Right. And I, I don't know. Are we allowed to curse on this? Absolutely. No. Okay. So there, there's this black dude, Alex Media is also on the show. And there's this tw- 15 second interaction that went viral that it was like, that Schultz was like, yo, man, when I took it, I felt like my dick got bigger. And Akash was like, me too. Yo, Alex, do you feel like your dick got bigger? And he just goes, no. And like, j- just that moment that <laughs> they created was so funny that it sold out all blue chew mm-hmm. there was no more blue chew for like two weeks they had to make more <laughs> of it to sell it because these guys literally sold like a million yeah, of them that's fantastic it's a great yeah. example yeah I don't, I don't know of a better example of that <laughs> yeah it's that's a that's a hell of a case study. Yeah, I I, I appreciate um, you know the the TikTokers out there that are funny, and I do recognize that as you said earlier, it's a very different muscle. Same thing for you know Instagram, and for that matter, same way for Twitter. Um, you know, I've always I, I've never considered myself 
any sort of professional humorist comedian. I try to be funny, but I don't consider myself a professional, um, even though I have written some stuff for clients before. But I consider myself to be really good at the snarky comment. Like I like to respond to people. Um, You're a reply guy. I'm a reply guy. I, 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 I've got a couple of, of folks on Facebook that are friends of mine that <laughs> we make it a game of how can I troll you the, the, the worst. Uh -huh. And uh, and some of our mutual friends know we do it, and they keep an eye on our comments just to say oh, that was really funny. So, so you're just out stuff. here hurting feelings. Oh yeah, that's that's all I'm. I'm all, I love <laughs> roasting. I love bitch. the. <laughs> I, I love it. It's it's fantastic. So you did this stand up thing for quite some time. What was your uh, what's your favorite or your best joke? Oy. Uh next question. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't. Yeah. Not going to throw one out there on a podcast. <laughs> no, I, I don't like tell joke jokes. You know what I mean? Right. It's, um, I'm, uh, I, I'm a white guy that gets away with uh, a ton of racial humor. Okay. There you <laughs> go. I get that. That's good yeah. context. I, I'm literally thinking about uh, calling my next album a white guy talking about race and religion. Well, nice. All yeah. Right. That might sell some copies just on the title. <laughs> That's a yeah, good one. <laughs> I like the sacred cows. There you go. Well, I, I was uh, a la TikTok. The, the one guy on TikTok that I like a lot is a dad joke guy. Um, just because I, like okay. I like to repeat his jokes to my kids and watch them roll their eyes. His name is Jeremy Little. I think he's really funny. Um, but uh, I actually wrote, I'm going to get, see, I want to throw this softball out there and see if you like it or not. Because I wrote a dad joke the other day. <laughs> and incidentally, it was a comment to someone on Facebook. And um, I, I just want to see what a professional comedian thinks of it. So the person said, um, my son is in desperate need of a tutor. Does anybody have any suggestions? And I responded, he's kind of on his own. They all died off in the 1600s. I really like that lamp that you have back there. Where, <laughs> where'd you get that lamp? That's neat. I love it. Well, Very geometric. I will tell you this. I will tell you this. My girlfriend, who does not think I'm funny at all, said, well, that's actually pretty clever. So I consider it a win, even though Good. it may not have been really funny. Yeah. Okay. Well, as long as, as long as your mom thinks you're handsome. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah. But, but to the point of, of the, the actual conversation is that um, I, I think that comics are extremely under leveraged as influencers mm -hmm. and which is why I'm so excited about my concept. Um, because it's like, there's, there's these comics that have huge, huge followings that like literally the only brand deals they get are boner pills and underpants, uh, you know, of, of kind of these like sin products, but there's, uh, they have big audiences that follow everything that they do, trust them and, and, and really show up for them in real life, you know? Um, and I get there's the, the wokeism and, and all that shit. And they're afraid of somebody saying the wrong thing. It's tied to whatever, but it's also, all bullshit, you know, like, I mean, I understand not all, all brands can do it, but it's like the ones that do step out and, and, you know, and trust these people, because the thing is that it's not really going to be seen past their audience, right? Like it, especially if it's with a, a podcast or something, it's like, you know, what is Seth Simon's going to write an article to <laughs> try to get, you know, to try to de-platform this one person. And, and, and also it's like, there's so many comics that aren't anywhere near that kind of, of comedy, right. That, that haven't done anything offensive that still are just so undervalued and so under leveraged. And, you know, and, and it's like the, the TikTokers, I, I know, I get that they're a very, uh, uh, they're very right now they're very much in the zeitgeist and it's, it's like everybody's kind of gambling on this future pl this future play mm -hmm. but their audiences don't necessarily have money yet right they're, they're like not they're not as uh as proven in terms of their their ability and willingness to show up um, the, the comics that have Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram followings, they are showing up for them. And there has to be 
a, a carryover between buying and being able to show up. Well, speaking of being able to show up, uh, if brands or anyone's interested in uh, your uh, new approach and plugging into a, a comedy writer's room, where do they go? Where do they find you online? Um, the site is funnier than you are.com spelled the English way. Uh, just, <laughs> just the way it's and on LinkedIn, it's Richie Redding and you can follow me on and pretty much everything. It's just Richie Redding, but, uh, yeah, funnier than you are.com. Well, we'll make sure the links to all that are in the show notes and, uh, no, this is a lot of fun, man. I, I could sit here and talk comedy with you all day. Uh, but I appreciate you talking about what you're doing with comedians, uh, here on the show. Thanks for the time. Well, if there's one thing I love is talking about myself. Thanks, brother. <laughs> <laughs> A true comedian you are. <laughs> Me. Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast, is presented by my book, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my monthly newsletter or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy Award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. I'm Ian Truscott here to tell you about Rockstar CMO FM. The M is the marketing and the F is the well you decide. As you wonder, does the world need another effing marketing podcast? Find out as every week I chat with friends old and new that I've met through my career from techie to CMO and share a tune, a cocktail and their marketing street knowledge. Just drop a dime into your podcasting jukebox and jive along with Rockstar CMO FM. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network.